So welcome to today's webinar um, on sustaining peak performance and how to be at our best whilst the world is at its worst. Um, today we're going to cover how to change negative thinking. Um, we're going to share a framework for success to help us in these um, really challenging times. And Gavin's going to share some new world leadership. Um, I'm thrilled to say we're joined by Gavin Drake of Mindspan Global. Uh, Mindspan have been delivering their mindset principles for over two decades across multiple sectors um, and across 15 different countries. Um, the session today is going to be recorded um, and then I'll send it to you within the next week. So please do feel free to ask questions as we're going along using the chat box um, on the right hand side. What we're going to do is Gavin's going to run the session um, first and then we will, um, we'll have a live Q&A session at the end. So, but if you've got a question, pop it in the chat box and I will come back to it. So, um, so enough about me and I will pass you over to the wonderful Gavin. Enjoy the session. Thanks Ellie, thank you. I'm assuming everyone knows how to make me their big screen, do they? Because I'm gonna be doing some stuff up on the flip chart. So you're gonna need to, I'm gonna to need to fill your screen so you can actually see that um, one way, shape or form. So uh, yeah, proper good afternoon and welcome everybody. Um, I speak to you from the depths of the wilds of Norfolk, which is where I live. Um, and obviously this year I've got really used to running sessions with all sorts of clients all over the place in my office, which is where we are at the, at the, at the end of our cottage. So it's, it's like a, a mid-1800s cottage, very low ceilings, tiny windows, so not really conducive to doing this really, but we've got a little bit of extra lighting and mic stuff going on, we're well set up. So hopefully when I'm filling your big screen, you can see everything I'm doing up on the flip, but welcome to this afternoon session. Um, when Ellie invited me to come and speak for a wee while with yourselves, um, I obviously said yes, that's why I'm here, and I've known Ellie a long time, and uh, yeah, I've done all sorts of good work together over a long, lot of years, um, and I really wanted to come and meet you guys and share a few things with you. My biggest challenge is, as Ellie knows, I can sort of talk for England, so I can, I can, we run sessions that are day, a day, two days, three days, four days long, so when someone says, can you come and speak for an hour and a half on something, I'll go yes, but that's my challenge, is keeping it to an hour and a half, so... After about an hour or so, Ellie might metaphorically get her shepherd's crook and yoik, yoik me off from the side of the stage, so to speak. But welcome to this afternoon session. Um, just a tiny bit of background in addition to what Ellie just shared with you, just so you have a little bit more context around me and I'm not so much of a stranger to you. Um, yeah, I have been doing this training and coaching for over two decades. I started Mindspan, uh, the company, uh, in 1998. Um, really born out of a passion for psychology, for personal development, and for wanting my own business, really. So all those things came together. And after many good discussions with my wife, Sue, we decided to take the plunge. I sort of gave up my employed career and started doing this. And here we are 22 years later, as Ellie said, worked across multiple countries, just about every type of client you can imagine, because we're really working out and talking about the huge importance of what we're doing in here at any time. So it doesn't matter whether you're a nurse in a hospital trying to deal with the stresses and strains of doing your job in the current climate, whether you're a professional footballer, whether you are a professional rugby player, whether you're in a sales team, whether you're in an admin team, whether you're a year 10 or 11 getting ready to do your GCSEs at school. We, work, we've worked, we continue to work across multiple sectors because the common link between all of us is we've all got a bit of kit in our head called a brain and we're just trying to help people to use it more effectively, essentially to help them perform. So when we start looking at a title for today, obviously thinking is my sphere, it's my area of specialism. So we are doing quite a lot of work with clients at the minute, much of it by video, or we were getting back to face-to-face -to -face recently, but that's obviously been stopped in the second lockdown, um, just around how we're thinking about stuff. So what I wanna share with you this afternoon is a little bit of a framework that we've evolved over two decades for mentally and emotionally how we can get the best out of ourselves so i'll share that with you shortly i'm going to share with you the most important thing i've ever learned in my whole life so that's pretty significant 58 years of it so far um and i'm going to share with you some recent work that we're we've been shaping around new world leadership so some leadership some more mental leadership work that we've just on the point of doing with some clients 
um, particularly related to the current world that we're in, this sort of very challenging new world, lots of remoteness, et cetera, et cetera, lots of uncertainty. I'm gonna share a very quick framework with you just to sort of sow that seed and with you around leadership and what we're focusing on at the minute. And then I'm gonna finish with quick reference to time in a certain context. So I'll give you the best of me over the next hour. Give me the best of your attention if you can. Scribble, I encourage you if you wish to, just to be scribbling some notes. Um, I chatted with Ellie about this and I decided to go old school. So we're not doing any PowerPoints, no whizzy stuff, just me. It's like um, Gavin Drake, Mindspan Acoustic. We're going back just to me and the flip chart, if that's okay. So I like old school. Yeah, hopefully you'll be able to see what I'm creating. I will talk you through everything. And uh, sadly, the sun's just gone in, so it's got rather dim here. So hopefully you can see me well enough to sort of yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. So um, I will get cracking. Um, as Ali said, if you have any questions, post them and we'll come to those at the end. So a bit of a grand title, New World Thinking. We are obviously in a challenging world at the minute. Um, this calendar year, I think for most of us to varying degrees, there's a heck of a lot of new stuff to deal with. Um, for many people in extreme cases, lives have been turned upside down. Some people in business, their business has been turned upside down. Um, some industries and organizations are under real pressure. Um, some are going bust. Equally, at the other end of the spectrum, some are absolutely thriving. And they're, for one reason or another, they're making the most of the current circumstances. So what we're seeing is what we always see, but particularly it's polarized in, uh, at the minute, is around just a whole variety of different reactions to a set of circumstances, really. So um, over the last 22 years, um, myself and the growing Mindspan team, we sort of take it upon ourselves to continuously look at psychological research, the latest um, thinking um, around our performance and around psychology, and just to try and take the most valuable bits of all of that to simplify them and share them in a way that people understand, firstly, and secondly, can, can then do something with, to be able to apply stuff, really. And over the last two decades, we've created within the Mindspan business our own framework for performance in it and this regardless of the field that someone works lives or operates in and we call that framework the mindspan triad on a full mindspan peak performance mind training program which is three days long lots of things come in threes so here are some threes so there are what we call three psychologies that are really important to all of us um, namely number one being what we call our self psychology. And this is really the huge importance of what we think about ourselves in, the, in various forms. And within that psychology, as we like to call it, are three competencies. We call them mental stroke, emotional competencies. The competency of focus, so hopefully you can read that. Focus, I think, is a very misunderstood word. It's, uh, we mentioned focus a lot in, well, particularly in the workplace. You know, it's quite common at a certain time of year for a a leader in a business um, on the annual staff at the annual staff conference to stand up at the front of a room or on a stage and talk about the challenges ahead and how we need to be focused. And people go, yeah, but the challenge is they often get back to their desks on Monday and think, well, I know I need to be focused, but what does that really mean? So how we focus is really important. That's one of the competencies we work on, as is belief, self-belief particularly. It's really important. We all know confidence is crucial to our performance and our confidence comes from our self-belief or or there's a spectrum of what we call self-doubt to self-belief so self-doubt undermines our confidence self-belief uh, creates our confidence so we took we look at a whole load of ways that we can build self-belief and confidence in ourselves the third competency in the area of self-psychology is what we call responsibility and again i think responsibility is another pretty misunderstood word Often, I think in our culture and society, we think about responsibility as something quite heavy, like I am responsible for this and it's my, it's my responsibility. Almost we wear responsibility like a burden. Um, the way we frame responsibility on our Peak Performance Mind Training Program is something that's liberating. And there's a direct link between the amount of control we feel we have in life and how much responsibility we take. And this is gonna sound a bit harsh and it's only my opinion at the end of the day. I think there's quite a lot of people in our society 
who want to feel in control but don't want to take responsibility for themselves, ultimately. It's responsibility for ourselves. You can, and this is just to want to get this out there today. I'm not, recover, I'm not going to cover a responsibility session with you, but just get this. You cannot, it's impossible to feel a sense of control in life, whichever wants to feel, if you don't take responsibility. One has to support the other. So it's really, we share a whole session around responsibility in a way which is quite mind stretching. Um, it challenges a lot of the ways that are culturally we think, but it can be, if you get your head around it, it's really liberating. So that's all an area of self psychology. The second psychology is what we call life psychology. And that's really how, generally, how do we think about life? Um, and how we think about life is crucial. We all develop multitudes of attitudes to life. Um, and again, it sort of saddens me a little bit the amount of people that I think, and again, it's only my opinion, um, don't have the healthiest attitude to life or time. Um, and I'm going to talk about time a little bit at the end of today's session, but just to sow some seeds, I think most pe a lot of people pay lip service to the importance of life and how valuable time is. People say those things, but they don't behave like they really know those things. So just three questions for yourself without you necessarily answering them to me, but ask yourself these questions. Be honest, how do you ever just let some of your time pass you by without really doing much with it? Do you ever, if you're honest with yourself, just waste time? Do you ever, thirdly, actually wish time away? There's, um, there's a, almost like a paradigm in our culture that people live by quite a lot around I'll be happy when. So people talk a lot about I'll be happy when the weekend gets here, I'll be happy when this session's finished and Gab stops talking, I'll be happy when I'm on holiday, I'll be happy when the coronavirus is over, I'll be happy when, 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 when. So what we also, what people often do in our culture and society as well too, is they, they wish time away. And actually one of the things we all want, which is to experience a reasonable level of happiness, we throw it away. We, we, we put it into the future and chase it. And that's really not the most helpful way to psychologically to wrap all of that stuff up yourself. So there's some key thing in the life psychology, um, the life psychology area around attitude. So how do we, what attitudes have we formed about life that help us or that hinder us? How can we create a particular attitude that just unleashes our ability to be happier more of the time? We then get more out of ourselves. We perform at higher levels. How clear are we? So clarity is a whole competency. How clear are we about where life is, where I'm trying to get to, what I want to fill my life with, how I can invest my energies in that wisely and create real purpose? So again, there's a whole, there's three really strong competencies around life psychology. And the third psychology is all what we call world psychology. And that's really how do we think about the world around us every day? Um, how well are we managing our emotions, particularly, we talk quite a lot about the emotions of stress and anxiety, uh, which are incredibly prevalent at the moment around our, our culture and society. So where are they coming from? What's causing them? Some strategies for lessening them. And then the final two competencies are really around relationships, because that's around people around us in our world. So how much empathy do we have? How well do we understand people? And again, around our new world leadership stuff that we're starting to do at the minute, a key area around that new world leadership is around uh, leadership with empathy. Not pink fluffy empathy, but real good quality. How well do we understand our people, what they're experiencing, what they're going through, and how well do we utilize that in how we lead them? And then ultimately that impacts how much influence we have on people around us in life. So that framework called the Mindspan Triad, um, in its, when we deliver that in its full version on our Peak Performance Mind program, that's three days long. We, do, we run quite a lot of leadership programs around three days of this and then six months of coaching on the back of it as well too, as well as actually the new world leadership stuff that we're working on. So I wanted to share just our frame, our, it's a unique framework for performance. Um, it wasn't dreamed up last week quite quickly. It's evolved over many, many years because we believe, and lots of our own evidence seems to re reinforce this, that these competencies, mental stroke, emotional competencies are fundamental absolutely fundamental to be working at them if we want to stand the best chance of getting the best out of ourselves in life and in work and business and everything else. If any of you want have a curious about any of this, I'm very happy to have you know further conversations with you after today. Okay. Now I mentioned without over-egging it that um, I wanted to share with you 
the most important thing I've ever learned in my whole life. Um, now this, that's something that we call the thinking cycle. Um, now in my early, more formal years of study, sorry, my formal years of study around the, the, the subject of the psychology, I kept coming across a basic message in lots of fields of psychology that really are in this model that I'm gonna share with you now. So we call this the thinking cycle. It is a cycle, so it's round. Um, if you're happy to, scribble it down, and I'm going to talk you through it, really, around its importance and the impact and stuff. So um, I'm going to write the word at the top here, the top of the cycle, the word thoughts. Now, um, what psychology tells us, and this comes out of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, this comes out of sports psychology and other, other aspects of psychology that I've studied, what psychology tells us is every second of every day, 24 hours a day, quite obviously there is stuff happening in our head. I'm just going to use that word, the word thoughts, to represent that stuff that's going on in our head all day every day. Now of course, just to clarify that a little bit, we have the capacity for what we could call conscious thought. Um, our conscious mind is absolutely tiny, um, so I would imagine there's 50 or so of you I think on this session, um, hopefully all of you at the moment, your tiny conscious mind is engaged in looking at your screen, listening to me and what I'm creating up on the flip chart. So that's the nature of your conscious activity at the minute. Obviously sitting behind that or around that in the background is a much greater amount of what we call subconscious activity, stuff you're not really that consciously aware of but it's going on. So we have a tiny bit of conscious activity, a huge amount of subconscious activity going on at any one time, I'm just using that word to wrap all of that up, just to keep it simple. And this is where it starts to get extra interesting. Um, and what psychology tells us, the nature of these, conscious and subconscious at any time, actually creates these. Our emotions, or for want of another, another term, how we feel. So let me just, um, before I start explaining this, there's a couple of things I just want to acknowledge because it's useful to acknowledge them. We know, I say we, I mean mankind, psychology, we know um, that there can be at certain times of life, there can be biological reasons why we might be producing certain hormones and the nature of those hormones absolutely can affect our mood. We know that. We also know from more recent research, certain food types, if we eat them, can affect our mood. So I just wanna take those two things that are very worthwhile acknowledging and just put them over here. And I want us to focus on this aspect of ourselves because I, we believe this aspect of ourselves sits above those two things I just, I just mentioned. This is probably even more important. So if I just play devil's advocate for a moment and Imagine one of you on this session now, for whatever reason, happens to be thinking, let's just say quite negatively about the session. Let's imagine one of you is having thoughts like this. Um, oh, what a waste of my afternoon this is. Um, I don't know why Ellie convinced me to attend this. I've never liked people in Norfolk. They're all a bit weird. Um, to be honest, Gavin's really quite irritating. I really wish I was doing something else. I can tell by the looks on two or three faces that I just described what you're doing. I can tell that, I think, no I can't. Anyway, imagine if one of you were having those thoughts now, how was that person likely to be feeling now? Probably disengaged, quite fed up, um, could be bored, excuse my language, quite pissed off, depending on their strength of thought, could feel quite angry. Now, if we just re reference anger, boredom, frustration, feeling pissed off, whatever, generally speaking, are they ways of feeling that you would like to be experiencing in your daily life? Well, probably not. People don't wanna be feeling like that at all or much. Are they the sorts of feelings or emotions that are conducive to getting quite a lot out of this session? Probably not. So actually, without overly delving into it, we can already establish for a number of reasons those ways of feeling are not particularly helpful at the moment. Now, it's perfectly feasible there could be someone else on the same session, so someone else in this group of 50 or so people, who happens to be thinking very differently to this person. Someone else could be thinking, 
whether you call it more positively or more constructively or whatever. But someone else could be having thoughts like, I've been really looking forward to this. Um, I've heard Gab's good, and he is. Just joking. Um, this is really interesting. I've got a real curiosity, curiosity around your psychology. This is going to be such a great 90 minute session, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if one of you were having those thoughts now, quite obviously, you wouldn't be feeling like this person that we just described here. Instead of being bored, frustrated, quite pissed off and fed up, this person's probably feeling engaged, enthused, positively curious. I'm probably pushing the boat out a little bit too early here, but there is the potential that you could get mildly excited on this session. Again, I think we are teetering on the edge with one or two of you. That's good. So the point is, if I could just flag this up, most of this you know, but I'm just going to really clarify this for you. By the time you leave this session after an hour or hour and a half, you won't all leave having had exactly the same experience, quite obviously. And yet you'll all be looking at the same screen listening to me. So why is it that you won't all have exactly the same experience? Well, because ultimately it's not me that's creating your experience, it's you. And the fact is you could be thinking quite differently across 50 odd people about what you're seeing, about what you're listening to, about what you're watching. You'll be interpreting it differently. You'll be attaching different stuff to it. Some of you, you know, genuinely could be not enjoying it and some of you could be loving it. That's the same, but you're on the same, you're in the same situation, if that makes sense. Now, for me, when I first came across just even this bit, and we've got more to go yet, I didn't just understand this many years ago. I absolutely got it. And that's always the challenge I give people. Don't just understand this, get it. Ultimately, it's not just on this session that it's you that's creating your experience. Where else do we do that in life and work and business? Everywhere. Everywhere you go, it is ultimately you that's creating your experience. It's not what's happening around you. It's how you interpret what's happening around you. It's how you think about what's happening around you. It's the stories you tell yourself. All of those are phrases for how we think. You can put two people into the same situation and they both feel very differently about it. Why? Because they're thinking about it differently. They're attaching a different meaning to the situation or they're interpreting it differently. So the great news for me is, this is before we even continue the cycle, Whilst this isn't easy, it is simple. If you wanna get the best out of yourself, whatever that means as you go through life, it's really, really important that you are mentally and emotionally in, a, in an effective place, if that makes sense. Really, really important. So where's all that going on? Well, that's not going on outside of you, that's going on inside of you. And if it's going on inside of you, the most helpful thing we can do is to start to get a grip of it start to be a bit more consciously aware of how we're functioning mentally, emotionally. And if, as soon as we have an awareness that we might be off in a less than helpful direction, there are some strategies for how we can then move ourselves into a more constructive or helpful direction, mentally and emotionally. Anyway, let's, let's continue with the cycle. And as I said, if you have questions, post them and we can answer some of these at the end. Now, let's get to the next quadrant. What psychology also tells us is the nature of these emotions that we create and experience, this little cocktail at any one time, and will actually drive, and I could use a few different words here, but I'll start off with this one. Our, these will drive our behaviors. So I've put behaviors. Other words I could use are our reactions, our responses, our decisions, our choices. All of that is really wrapped up in here. So coming back to this session, if we're using that as an example to bring this to life, if one of you is thinking really negatively and um, destructively about the session so you're bored you're frustrated you're quite pissed off and fed up typically how you're going to behave on the session well you won't be paying your attention span will be poor you certainly won't take any notes you won't participate you won't ask any questions and to be honest you're probably going to leave quite early so all of that is going to mean you aren't going to get much from what we're doing now flipping it over to whoever whichever one of you is here so you're you know, you're thinking really constructively about what we're doing you're enthused, you're engaged, you're bordering on mild excitement, quite obviously, behaviorally, you'll be very different to this person. You will stay to the end. You will probably take two or three pages of notes. You'll have two or three questions for me at the end. You'll probably take my mobile number to give me a call about something tomorrow because you're so curious about the subject. So guess what? Guess which person is going to take more from this 90 minutes? It's obvious, isn't it? Um, now, again, it's not, I'm just using this session just to bring this to life, but this applies to every scenario of life, every scenario. 
again, I know people's personal circumstances are different. You know, I live, I feel very, very privileged to live where I live. So I live on a country lane, which is a dead end. There's three or four other properties. I can look out of the field of my office and there's cows in that field. There's horses just over there. There's a lane there which we get deer in and all sorts of nature. I love it, absolutely love it. So actually through lockdown, you know, if I'm working at home, I can just at any time just think, I'm just gonna get some fresh air. I can just walk up the lane. I can go and sit in my garden. I can listen to the birds. Now that's a real privilege. That's not everyone's experience. I'm not, I'm not a young parent with three young children living on the 10th floor of a block of flats with no garden. Now, so I do feel fortunate. But what we will also find is there will be people who live in the sort of circumstances I live in who will be feeling slightly better than other people, if that makes sense, in the lockdown. You'll have two people that live on the same floor, maybe on the 10th floor of a block of flats. So they live in the same place, but they'll be having a different experience. Why? Because they're thinking about the, the lockdown situation differently, if that makes sense. So it's, it's any and every scenario we're in, it's so important how we think, because that creates how we feel, that drives what we do. Now, just taking it up from six o'clock to nine o'clock, just before I write the final word in here, I just want to make a point about this bit. Um, I'm not sure what your thoughts are, but certainly in the Mindspan business, myself and the rest of the team, we believe if you think about the world outside of you every day, so what I mean is all this stuff and paraphernalia going on around us every day, that's things, it's people, it's situations, different scenarios, stuff that's geographically close to us, stuff that's geographically a long way away from us, all this stuff outside of us. We believe there's very little of that, if any of it, that you and I have absolute full control over. Now, again, it probably sounds obvious when I say that, but people don't live like that's obvious. Let me tell you what I mean. I think most adults get up most days with an underlying intention to try and control the world. So what I mean by that is most people want the world to fit their version of it. Most people want other people to match their expectations. Now, when the world doesn't measure up to, to how you think it should be, when other people don't match your expectations, that's usually the trigger for stress, anger, frustration, and all those less, some of those less than helpful emotions that we experience far too much of. I learned a long time ago that I couldn't control my children. I've got two children, they're 30 and 28 now, but when they were small, I learned a long time ago that I couldn't control them. And I don't mean by that that they were badly behaved, I just mean I can't control them. So stop trying. Stop trying to control your children. And if I don't have control, what do I have? I have amazing potential influence amazing potential influence as their parent. And probably, this is some of what psychology told me a long time ago, if I, want a bit, if I want to have the most constructive, impactful influence over my children as I'm bringing them up, I need to get control of or a grip of a particular person. Namely, which one? Well, this one. Most people have what we call an external locus of control. They're trying to control everybody else and all this stuff out here. No wonder they're stressed. No wonder they're wound up because you can't control something. You can't get control of something that you don't have control of, but you do have influence. The one person most people have more ability to get a grip of or control of is the one they don't, which is this one. So this model predominantly for me helps us realize how we all function and how we can start to get a grip of ourselves and then get the best out of ourselves and be the most positive, constructive influence on those around us and the world around us. Because ultimately, this is what psychology is saying. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, it's what we're doing in our head, consciously and subconsciously, that creates how we feel. That cocktail of emotions drives what we do. And that, in a world we don't have full control over, has a massive impact on our outcomes or the way things are turning out. So generally speaking, If we're running around unwittingly with a really negative, destructive, unhelpful mindset, attitude or psychology, that's going to have an emotional consequence. That's going to have a behavioral consequence. And that's also going to have an outcomes consequence. We could be inadvertently creating more of the things we don't want, but we don't realize our role in it. Quick example of that is most people tell me they want to be happy. And yet happiness as an emotion is not on the increase in our society stress and anxiety and 
anger. They're on the increase. So we want this, but we're creating that. Does that make sense? But most people think it's the world making them angry. It's an external locus of control. Nope, it's you that made yourself angry based on your perception of what someone did or whatever's going on out here. Once you know it's you, it doesn't mean you necessarily will change, but if you want to change, at least you have the capacity to do so. If I don't want to be angry and stressed and uptight, if I know it's me, I can do something about it. So I learned a long time ago, if in my life I'd like to create all sorts of outcomes that are positive and constructive for me, and the things I want in my life, the places I want to visit, the experiences I want to have, emotionally how I want to engage with the world, all that's my positive constructive outcomes. I realized a long time ago, the most important factor in whether I can do that effectively or not is my psychology. It's my mindset every day, it's my attitude every day, it's the way I think about things, it's my perception of stuff. Now what then also happens, just to complete the cycle is, we then reflect on how life's turning out and we do that constructively or destructively, usefully or unusefully, helpfully or unhelpfully, or just for want of another word, positively or negatively in the cycle, just continues. You've always been in this cycle, you're in this cycle now, so am I, and we always will be. Big question to ask yourself is now you've got clarity around it, is your cycle running more here or here? Because it's a big, big question to be asking yourself. So because of this, we always encourage people to think about how you think, which sounds a bit deep, I get that, but we need to start getting a grip, more of a conscious idea of what am I doing mentally and emotionally? What am I engaging in? I posted a, I walked the dog this morning and I've just recently started to, when I'm walking the dog, just record a minute, two minutes or three minutes of my musings on the mental side of things. And actually I was talking this morning as I was walking Maisie the dog about what we, you know, what are we tending to think about and focus on most on an average day? Because what we tend to think about and focus on most on an average day is what we then, we give more energy to we give more life to, and that becomes our experience. Now, bearing in mind the current climate, there's not a lot of cheerful news around. They've got 24 seven news on TV, on radio, on social media, on everything else. And a lot of it is not that cheerful. So if I'm watching that stuff all day, every day, taking all of that stuff in every day, I don't expect to be too cheerful. Now, if I can just watch it for 10 minutes just to get an update, that's fine. But if I then spend more time thinking about and focusing on the opportunities that could be around the corner, the fact my kids are healthy, the fact that I live in a lovely part of the world, the fact that I've, I am physically and mentally able, the fact that um, there are so many opportunities for me for the rest of my life. Does that make sense? If that's where I put my thoughts and focus, firstly, I'm going to feel much better. Secondly, I'm going to start driving the behaviours that help me to be more successful rather than isn't everything isn't everything terrible all of the time doesn't life suck isn't all of this terrible aren't the government useless is doesn't my employer suck etc etc that's going to really make me feel like this i'm going to be pretty passive and not do much about anything just let's sit in a corner and wait for it all to pass no wonder my life doesn't look very good obviously i could go on about this for years but the point is that's how we that's the cycle we're all in now just to reinforce that i've written this rather strange but i think important key message as I like to call them this just reinforces what I shared with you around the thinking cycle it's not what you think about that's crucial it's how you think about what you think about that's crucial now that's a weird sentence it's a bit of a brain twister but just to say it at normal pace it's not what you think about that's crucial it's how you think about what you think about that's crucial it's never the subject that you're thinking about which is the most important thing it's always how you think about it it's your take on it. It's your interpretation. It's the story you tell yourself. So this, in that rather long-winded sentence, that is probably the most important word. It's how we think about all this paraphernalia all the time. And that's the most important thing. That's the penny that dropped with me years ago. I guess for 20-odd years, I consistently challenged myself about how am I thinking about this? Am I thinking about this helpfully or unhelpfully? The way I'm thinking about this situation, is that liberating me and empowering me? Or is that diminishing me? The way I'm thinking about this is that making is this is that making me motivated or demotivated? The way I'm thinking about what the person said is that does that mean I can calmly interpret what they're saying, or am I going to have a shouty argument with them? Because these are all the questions that come from how we think about stuff. Anyway, um, Ellie, what uh, I've got I've realised I've got a clock in front of me. How am I doing time-wise? 
Uh, yeah, you're okay. It's two thirty-six. Okay, fab. Okay, so just building on the thinking cycle, what I'd like to do, so hopefully you all get that, but you might be sitting there thinking, all very well, Gav, now I know how I function, what about if I want to change my thoughts? Well, there's lots of tools we can share with you, but we haven't got that long, so I'm going to share one with you. Okay, so let's just think, let's consider the top of the thinking cycle for a moment. So I want to just introduce you to something that we call thinking spirals. Okay, now you might have even used that phrase before, but this is when we allow our thoughts to spiral. Firstly, sometimes in an unhelpful direction. So I'd like to imagine something um, challenging has occurred in your life. Something's gone a bit pear shaped. You've failed big time or you've messed something up. Something's gone a bit wrong. And you allow that to be the catalyst or the trigger for you to think quite negatively and destructively. And that's not just a fleeting thought. You get into what we call quite a spiral. You keep thinking, you keep thinking these negative, destructive thoughts, and you get yourself into what we call a really negative, destructive, downward thinking spiral. And you're in, just for want of a better term, what we call, you're mentally in the red zone. It's a particularly less than helpful place to be. This is not where you get the best out of yourself. This is actually where you end up making things worse without, without realizing it. Um, and the longer you're in this downward thinking spiral, the deeper it gets. The deeper it gets, the harder it is to get out. Briefly, the brain is a very habitual mechanism. The more you have certain thoughts, the more you'll keep kicking into those thoughts. They just become more, um, the neural pathways get so strong, you just keep engaged, your brain keeps going to them again and again and again. And the longer you stay in this, you create what we call a very low state of mind. Now, I'm not knocking people at all. It's perfectly understandable because life and the world is a bit different and it's quite challenging. There's quite a lot of people running around with one of these to varying degrees at the minute. There's a lot of low state of mind around. There's a heck of a lot of red zone psychology going on. And there's a lot of people that don't know they're doing it, but they're spiraling mentally and emotionally. I'm sure, I mean, obviously you don't need to answer this, but I'm sure I've drawn a squiggle, an arrow and some words. I'm sure you can all acknowledge at different times of your life, you have done this. So have I. With what I've learned over many years, I, these days, if I start to slip into one, I know very quickly I'm doing it. So I don't let it get too far before I then try and do something to shift it. But we've, we've all done this. Equally, we've all done the complete opposite. We've all had phases of life, <clears throat> and again, we don't consciously know we're in them actually a lot of the time, where for one reason or another, you've been thinking really positively, really constructively, um, really helpfully about yourself, about life, about the challenges ahead, about where you're at, and you're in <clears throat> what I call a really great upward spiral. Now, I haven't learned how to draw one of these upwards yet, so there it is. You're in an upward spiral, okay? You're very much in what we call the green zone. This is where you get the best out of yourself. This is where you get into that real flow state <clears throat> where even big things just seem quite easy to deal with. The solutions to things just come to you. Um, you're so decisive because you're seeing things much more clearly. You've got incredible belief and confidence in yourself. And you're just carrying that around with you and you're in what we call a very high state of mind. Again, all of us have been in this place as well, sometimes for a little bit of time, sometimes for a bit longer, and you don't always know you're out of it until you're out of it, if that makes sense. But anyway, these are two extremes, real red zone, real green zone, and there's lots of variations in between. Certainly as a consequence of today's session, I'd encourage you from today onwards, be much more consciously aware when you are slipping into this, mentally and emotionally. Now, how can you start to be more aware of that? I often say to people, I encourage them to be more consciously aware of how you're feeling. Now, you can, you can pay more attention to each element of the cycle, and some of these are more easy for certain people to be aware of than others. For most of us, absolutely, we can be aware, more aware of these. When are you in a situation when you are not feeling great, when you are more stressed and as helpful, when you're starting to get a bit anxious, when you're not feeling confident in yourself. Because that's a, if you pay more attention, 
all oh, right, that's, that's how I'm feeling and it's not very helpful. And if you're feeling that way, where are those feelings coming from? Well, they're coming from you. Something that you're doing in your head, consciously or subconsciously. So pay more attention, be more aware. And what, if we can be more aware of when we're slipping into a less than helpful red zone spiral, stop ourselves, we're gonna find a way of stopping ourselves and then building a bridge consciously over to the green zone. So be, be aware and then build your bridge over to here. Now, how on earth can we do that? Well, <clears throat> there's a very quick three-step process, which is simple, but it really isn't easy, but it absolutely becomes easier when you practice this, okay? So, again, if you're taking notes, please take a note of this, because you can go and practice this. So next time, you, next time you're in the red zone. So the trick is, firstly, you need to be aware that you're in the red zone. If you're not aware of it, you'll just carry on being in the red zone. So you need to take that little conscious mind and suddenly have a little bit of awareness around, almost like, Gav, what are you doing? What, what, what's happening here? <clears throat> so next time you're in the red zone, here's the first thing to do. Tell yourself, to stop. Now, if you're with a group of people, when you suddenly realize you're in the red zone, can I please encourage you, don't do this out loud, because they'll just look at you and think you're a bit weird if you just blow out, stop. Um, obviously, if you're on your own, say it out loud, because it's slightly more powerful. If you're with people, just do that in your head. Now, as simple as that is, what is that doing? Now, bear in mind you're spiraling negatively, you're suddenly aware of it and you just do, you just do this. So if it was me, I'd just go, oh, Gav, come on, stop. Stop what you're doing. Now, by doing that, that's called psychologically what we call an interrupt. And that creates a small window of opportunity to make a change or shift. If you tell yourself to stop and you don't do something in the next few seconds, that window of opportunity closes and you'll then kick straight back into the spiral again. So tell yourself to stop and then quite quickly do the next thing. And the next thing is this, <clears throat> then take a deep breath. Now, just like telling yourself to stop was interrupting your mental and emotional spiral, taking a deep breath interrupts your, physio your physiological spiral. Um, when we're usually uptight, anxious and stressed in that spiral, um, we tend to breathe high and shallow. So by doing the complete opposite, you are creating that window of opportunity again. You're creating a quick shift into a different physiology. All these two things are doing are preparing you for step three, which is where the magic can happen. So, so these don't do the job. These are just preparation. The third step is this. Then ask yourself the thinking question. And the th thinking question is very simple. It is a fabulous tool. You always have it at your disposal to use at any time. So lots of people we work with will write the thinking question down and they'll put it on the fridge with a fridge mag um, on the fridge with a magnet. Sometimes put it on a post-it note on the dashboard of their car or by their PC or they put it on their phone so it flashes up a few times a day. Now before I share the thinking question with you I should just explain Questions are an amazing way of influencing thought. If I were to ask, if you and I, say I was, I was with you personally, and we were face to face, and I, I asked you a question, as long as we've got a level of rapport and you're listening to me, I ask you a question, you then go in your head and start thinking about the subject of the question. So a, I've asked you a question, I've actually influenced what you are now thinking about. Questions are amazing. We don't use questions particularly helpfully, because if I ask myself this question, why am I so useless? I'm now thinking about why I'm so useless. Well, I could also ask myself the question, and what can you learn from this then? How can I be better next time? Both, all of those questions influence what I'm gonna think about next. So actually, the thinking question is very powerful if you practice using it in terms of shifting from a red zone to a green zone spiral or place. This is the thinking question. I'll write it in nice big letters so you can see it. The thinking question is this. How 
do I need stroke want? You can use either of those words. How do I need or want to think about this? Bearing in mind whatever this is. What's the subject of your grief? What's the subject of the problem? What's the what's just happened? What's the thing you've just failed at? Failed at. So how do I want stroke need need to want you to think about this? Now again, you ask yourself that quick. Bear in mind you're in a spiral. You've told yourself to stop. You're taking a deep breath, and you then say, "All right, come on, Gav. How do you need to think about this? Or how do you want to think about this?" I'm now giving myself another window of opportunity to move, to change my thoughts, to tell myself a different story to reframe, these are all words for shifting our thoughts, myself to get move myself from here over to here. So I could find myself getting really anxious about everything that's out of my control at the minute, government making decisions, we're in lockdown. So of course we were coming out of, we were out of lockdown as a training and coaching company, we were getting back to working face to face with people as well as loads of video delivery. Suddenly we've got another new lockdown, all the face to face work we were doing in November has been postponed. Now I could get stressed about that all month. I could get anxious about that all month, or I can think, okay, Gav, um, how do you want to think about this then? I can't change it. Boris isn't going to change his mind if I ring him. We are in a lockdown. What I can do is say, okay, I could answer that question, the thinking question with, okay, I can't control whether in lockdown or not. I also can't control clients that obviously don't are reluctant to do face-to-face -face work for obvious reasons. So, okay space that's freed up in my diary, how can I use that wisely? What am I going to do with that to make the most of my time? Does that make sense? So again, you can use this in any situation. Did I see some jazz hands there? What was that for? The fact that you've got freed up time in your diary means that you can join us. Exactly, exactly. I'm now able to do this for you guys, for you guys. Absolutely. So just to sort of summarize a little bit around what's shared with you so far, and there's a couple of other things I just want to reference. Um, what I've shared with you here, let me come back stage further, sorry. If we want to get the very best out of ourselves, whatever field of endeavor we operate in, so of course I've shared this with, I've sometimes I've been called by professional football clubs over the years when they're really struggling to come and do some work with the coaches and the players. We work with leadership teams, we work with sales teams, we work with all sorts of teams in commercial companies, loads of work in the public sector, kids in schools, anybody really, all over the world. These, this framework we know works. We've got, we've been doing this a long time. We know when people work at these competencies and they develop them within themselves, they feel differently, they perform at higher levels, they get more out of themselves, not just in the workplace, because obviously you learn this stuff and it's, it's as applicable to non-work life as it is to, to, to work. That's why we get quite a lot of buy-in from people when we're training them, because they realize quite quickly, oh, this is just for me, isn't it? Yeah, it's just for you. How you can become an even better version of you. So we know focus, belief, responsibility, attitude, clarity, purpose, emotion, empathy, and influence are key competencies that we need to work on. Underpinning all of those is this, which is simple. Hopefully, well, you will understand it, but hopefully you'll get it, that actually this is where it's at. Just on that front, most never ceases to amaze me, but most leadership and management of other people is aimed here. When we're leading and managing people, most of our leadership and management activities are aimed here at someone else. We're trying to get them to do certain things within a certain time scale to a certain quality. That's, that's where we aim our, our management leadership stuff. Now, I get that, and of course, that's, that has a level of relevance, but actually, I think we should be aiming more of our leadership and management activities and behaviors and skills here in other people not here should be here all of you have, have have had this as an example in your career where you've seen so you've known someone who knows what to do they have the skills to do it they know when they should do it by and they know to what quality they should do it they just don't do it why because they're mentally and emotionally they're not in the place that allows them to and that's that those people are hard to manage and lead. And when they're like that and they still just keep not, they don't do it. We then try some other stuff there, some other leadership and management. We try some more activities there. Then we go to performance management stuff and then we fire them. When actually 
sometimes the switch was here that needed to be flipped. So we shouldn't all be psychotherapists. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is we need to realize this is how people function. And sometimes we need to be more effective as leaders, for goodness sake, around stop aiming our leadership stuff here, aim it here. Because that's what gets people going. That's, that's what drives them to do stuff. And then hopefully gets the outcomes that you all want together. But pr primarily I shared this for you because this is about you. Um, and ultimately realizing and challenge yourself with how are you thinking about stuff on an average day? Um, it's also quite sobering that apparently, it's not my research, but apparently each of us is likely to have between 60,000 and 70,000 thoughts in a day. That's a lot. And if you stop and think, if you're having 60 or 70,000 of them, and there's a consequence for every one, emotionally, behaviorally, and how that's impacting how things are turning out, the nature of our thoughts is critical. And the other th interesting thing to realize, and again, it's not my research, it's other people more eminent than me, of those 60 to 70,000 thoughts, for most of us, most of the time, 90% of them on a day are gonna be pretty much the same as the day before and pretty much the same as the next day. So if we've got really ingrained, unhelpful ways of thinking, that's just going on every single day. And this cycle is really not running well for us. Flip side is, if we can really get a grip, more consciously work at constructive, helpful thoughts. Actually, after a while, they become the ones you engage in every day. And then you have this flow state where you're getting the best out of yourself more of the time. So my encouragement is after today, please think about how you think. Don't tie yourself up in knots, just get more of a grip. If you want to change your thoughts at any time to move from the red zone over to the green zone, there, sorry, there is something, not there, there is something you can practice. Asking yourself the thinking question. Tell yourself to stop, take a deep breath, and then really play with this question. I play with this question every day. I've done it for years. I've probably been working this for so long. I do the stop, deep breath, question thing all in one go. I don't need to do it three separate steps. I just do it all in one go. But of course, that takes practice, but it's certainly worth practicing. Now, just on the back of that, just a couple of extra things, and I appreciate I'm talking quite quickly because I want to give you this stuff in the time scale provided. Um, reference some stuff we've been doing recently. We've designed some new leadership work that we were asked to design for a key public sector client that's got 6,000 employees. They asked us to, do, to, to work on some design stuff around some a slightly refreshed way of looking at leadership. Um, now, I'm not going to go through all of that with you because I haven't got the time with you. I did want to share with you what sits in the middle of what we should be carefully considering as leaders and managers in this world that we're in now, with everything that's going on. We really need to focus on what we call these five key psychological needs that everybody has, but these needs in the current, in this year, because of what's happening with the pandemic and coronavirus, our ability to meet these needs in our day-to-day -day lives has really become under threat. People aren't meeting these needs very easily, if at all. So if we know that people have these needs in the workplace, particularly as leaders, can we help them in the way that we lead and manage them to meet some of these, not completely, but start to meet some of these needs in the workplace so they feel better, so they feel more comfortable, so they feel more engaged in a difficult set of circumstances. So very quickly, just take you through these, the need for control. We all have a need for control, but our need for control has been turned, uh, it's just, it's not being met in so many ways. Because as I said, some people don't know whether they're gonna be able to pay their mortgage. Some people don't know whether they're gonna have a job. We don't know whether, you know, for us, when are we gonna get back to face-to-face -face delivery? There is no stake in the ground at the minute that says coronavirus will end on this date, the 28th of February. That's not, we don't have that. So we've got so much uncertainty about all sorts of things that we're not in control of anyway, but we, they, are, they are perceived threats to our daily existence and, and the lives that we've created and the homes that we have and the jobs. So all people have a need for control. In the way that you manage and lead your teams, can you give them some control? Can you give them more choice and option about how they do things or when they do them? Can you give them more say in some of the decisions? But none of these are rocket science things, but actually if you can start to integrate in your way you lead and manage, some of that stuff, you are going to be meeting a need that everyone has, 
that a lot of people are struggling to meet at the minute. Now, what does that do for their, then their level of engagement in their job, their level of buy-in to you and your organization? The second need is hope. Now, hope can sound like a bit of a weak word, like, I really hope we do well. I don't mean hope in that sense. I mean hope for the future. I found it really interesting because we've had months and months and months of negative, less than pleasant news, disasters. You've got Brexit in the background. We've had the American elections. You've got Trump playing up. There's all that stuff. And if we're not careful, our hope for a bright future just looks <laughs> just not, not doable. So actually, as managers and leaders, we don't want to be delusional. But what hope are you trying to what hope are you trying to engender and create in your teams of people? Are you giving them a glimmer of something that they can hold on to? Are you, you know, whether that's, you know, the opportunities that look like they're going to be there next year. And so if you take recruitment, recruitment's been hit, obviously, to varying degrees with different recruitment consultants. And that's not easy. And some consultancies might have gone by the wayside, etc. Some might not have done. But actually, you know, what are we doing to still eke out some business? How are we, you know, does it, are we looking at this thinking, actually, do you know what, this, this, this um, pandemic is making us better. So actually, when things return to some semblance of whether it's you know, normal, whatever that means, we're going to be in such a good place to, to thrive. You know, are those the sorts of things we're sharing? I don't mean be delusional and pink and fluffy, but hope is so important. As I, as I was just saying, when the news about the vaccine, the first vaccine came out, the Pfizer vaccine, suddenly everyone was like, oh, you know, and, and it's not even here yet. We don't even know when we're going to get it. But it was just a, it was the first bit of good, good news that had seemed to come out for ages. And people were just like, oh, it just feels so good. Yeah, because there's a little bit of hope now. There's a glimmer of hope of something. So as a leader, how much are you building hope in your people? But realistic hope, not delusional. We all know about collection, um, connection and belonging. Most, most people are working from home way more. Um, and whilst we can do this, and thank goodness we can, it isn't the same. It really isn't the same. I'd much rather be in a room with you 50 people than doing it this way, but this is better than not doing it at all. So what are we doing to help people feel connected with each other? What are we doing to help people feel connected with you as a leader? Help people feel connected to the business, to what we're doing? You know, are we doing a bit more of this? You know, there's a, a client I was talking to a little while ago and they're saying, yeah, we have lots of meetings on Zoom or Teams, which is great. We can still sort of meet, meet up that way, but people have been saying they really miss the half past eight on a Monday morning weekend catch up, you know, where you don't talk about works, like how's your weekend go and all that sort of stuff. Cause we don't tend to do it on these meetings. I just said to them, well, why don't you set up that facility on teams? Just say to anyone wants to check in at eight 30, just, we just, we're not even going to talk, please don't talk about work. It's just an opportunity to talk about non-work stuff with people. Now it's not going to solve all world problems, but it just helps people just feel a little bit more connected. So be creative as a leader. What can you do to help people feel connected in a world where we're feeling more disconnected. Purpose is crucial, we all, that's, it's always important in life. We have a whole competency on purpose in our triad. A lot of people's purpose has been turned on its head. You know, can they still achieve the things they want to achieve in these difficult times? So how can we, again, particularly in a work-based sense, help people to feel really purposeful, help them invest their energies wisely on really, on valuable things, rather than just go through the motions, rather than just try and get through this you know, without feeling like we're contributing very much. So a lot of purpose is around working at the right things, the things that we value and feeling like you're contributing, being fulfilled. That's really important. And finally, we have this whole thing around understanding. Whilst we're all going through this together, we're not all experiencing it the same way. So if you think, well, this is how I feel about it, so therefore my other people must feel the same way. No, I know you <laughs> not at all. So just because it's your experience doesn't mean it's your team's experience. Doesn't even mean in the same team, people are experiencing it in the same way. So again, what are you doing as a manager or a leader to really demonstrate your understanding of people? And that's when you start getting into that massively important thing called empathy. So again, I wanted to share our triad with you, this framework for performance. I wanted to share with you the foundation stone of all performance really, which is the thinking cycle, how you can shift from the red zone to the green zone if you realize you're in it with a little three-step process. But I also wanted to share with you because this is fairly hot off the press around some key work that we're doing around new world leadership as we call it. Please, these we always have these needs as a species, we always have these needs, but these are amplified in most people at the minute. I call them amplified needs. They're even bigger because most, people aren't meeting these needs very easily in their day-to-day -day life or they're under threat so in the workplace 
And through you as a leader, how can you lead in a way that helps them meet those? And just to finish, before I open up for some questions, um, again, I want to just finish on something you already know, but something I'm passionate about. Lastly, um, Ellie knows this because I've probably bashed her over the head with this metaphorically oh, hundreds and thousands of times over many years. There are 1,440 minutes in a day. Now, the reason I just flag that up is, and you might have known that or you might not, most of us reference the 24 hours in a day, but that's 1,440 minutes. Um, for one reason or another, some personal tragedy in life years ago and some other stuff, all stuff that we'll all experience at different times, but for reasons a long time ago, when he was as a child, I learnt or concluded a long time ago the value of this. And as I sort of said a little while ago, I think most, a lot of people will reference, yeah, life's really valuable or time's really valuable, but I don't see them behaving like time is valuable or life is really valuable. And I don't want to finish on a downer, but I do quite like to stir people up. Um, I think most people take this for granted. They don't even give it a second thought. You just wake up in the morning, crack on with another day, effectively or ineffectively. They don't even think about it. Now, sadly, in my experience, most people ultimately realize the value of something in life when they've lost it or there's not much of it left. Now, rather than start valuing this when you get old and thinking, oh, yeah, life was really valuable. I wish I'd have done more with it. I wish I'd have spent my time more wisely. I wish I'd have done, wish I hadn't done that job I hated for so long, or I wish I'd have made more of that career opportunity, or I wish I'd have spent more time with my kids, or I wish, I wish, I wish. So most, a lot of people start thinking about the value of life when they're getting towards the, the end. My encouragement to people is, don't do that. Don't think about the value of life when you get to the end. Think about the value of life every single damn day. Because this is precious. You will never have the 18th of November, 2020 ever again. It's a unique single day of your life. When your head goes on the pillow tonight and you ask yourself, what have I done with today? I know you're partially you're gonna say, well, I was listening to that guy from Norfolk for an hour and a half. Yeah, I know there's that and there's other stuff you've been doing. This probably, just to be serious for a minute, this probably is more valuable than anything else, anything else. So if I had, um, if I had a 250,000 pound Ferrari car, I haven't got one, but just imagine I owned one. But tragically and sadly, I wasn't given this today because something happened to me. Well, that Ferrari is no use to me now whatsoever because I'm not here. If I had a 10 bedroom country estate with 50 acres worth a few million pounds, and again, I haven't, but if I did have, but I wasn't given this today, and of course, that country estate is of no use to me at all. It's quite nice for the people I left behind, but it's no use to me. If I had a million pounds in my bank account, and again, I haven't yet, I am working on that one, um, but I wasn't given this today, then of course, that money's of no use to me. Now, this isn't an anti-materialism speech by any stretch. I'm as interested in a nice, a nice standard of living as anybody else. You know, I've, I've lived in nice houses, I have driven nice cars, I've had some nice holidays, I've helped my kids through school, I've done universal, I've done all that paraphernalia, and I'm still trying to do it as well too. But all that stuff's nice and much of that can give me pleasure. I can get pleasure from the home I live in. I can get pleasure from a car if I like cars. I can get pleasure from a holiday or an experience. I can get pleasure from all of that stuff. But probably more important than any of those things is this. And yet we don't place the same value on this as we do all those material things, which I think is a real shame. So just to flag this up, something again you know already, my encouragement is in terms of an attitude to time and to life, you might have this anyway, but if you, if you reflect and think, actually, no, I don't have this yet, please wake up tomorrow morning and the very first thought I encourage you to have is, brilliant, I've got another one. I've been given another day to do the things I wanna do, be the things I wanna be and have the things I wanna have. It's not all easy around us at the minute, I just get up every day pretty thankful for what I have, pretty thankful for another day, and I'm going to do something with it. Same as this session. I'm not going to waste this 90 minutes going through the motions, wishing, you know, wishing it was over. I'm going to put something in. I'm going to give it some energy. I'm going to give it some passion. I'm going to give it some conviction. Why? Because I want to enjoy it. And hopefully you enjoy it as well in the meantime. So you either would have enjoyed it or I would really have annoyed you, one of the two.
but that's all about what's going on in your head anyway. So, um, probably shared quite a lot of stuff with you there that you might have already known or you half knew. Um, but yeah, I just it's just great. And I really thank Ellie for saying, Gav, would you? I just love the opportunity with another 50 or so people to share some passions. To, none of this stuff was made up last week. It's all tried and tested and comes has basis in psychological research and everything else. But we don't need to be psychologists to get the best out of ourselves. We just need to know a bit about how this works and how we can use it more effectively. So um, I'm just going to open up to questions, queries. If you want to, if there's anything I've shared with you and you think that's complete nonsense and you want to talk about it, we can. So over to or Ellie or whoever. Yeah. That was a great session, Gav. Thank you. Um, I've, I've got some questions that people have put in as we're going along, if that's OK. But um, mm -hmm. and I'm, there's, there's lots of comments, so I'm trying to um, stay on top of them at the same time. So um, one lady who's had to go has asked, but I know um, I'll send her the recording, so I'll, I'll still ask the question. She says, how can how can we choose to respond positively to a negative thought? Um, well, I guess I'd probably go back a stage and say, well, what do we mean by a negative thought? So I know I've used a positive sign and a negative sign on the thinking cycle. Um, but what I often say, I, uh, that's to make a point, really. What I often um, encourage people with is, I, I don't like using the phrase not negative thinking and positive thinking. Um, I do use it just so people get what I'm talking about, but I prefer to use thoughts like, you know, is that a helpful thought? Is that a constructive thought? Is that a destructive thought or unhelpful? Because what I don't want anyone to think as they leave today's session is that Gavin is saying, if you go and have pink fluffy positive thoughts, your life will be perfect. Now, actually that's probably quite delusional. So I would, what I'd be really interesting is, in is, that lady who's not here now, what does she mean by a negative thought? Because I'd probably be able to answer that question more if she gave an example of what she thinks a negative thought is. Mm. If that makes sense. So that's yeah. a little challenge for me to answer that. Um, I'll give her your contact details. And yeah, please do. Have a, have a chat. Um, somebody else has pointed on the um, on the five um, five needs for the for the new leadership. Um, is that related to Maslow's hierarchy of needs at all? No. No, that's just couldn't be further away from Maslow's hierarchy of needs if we tried, because that was actually that's really interesting because I mean, obviously that is amazing work. Good old Abraham Maslow. And yeah, we've looked at that for decades and decades. It still has relevance. Absolutely still has relevance today. We were asked to look at creating something new around the world, uh, the world we're living in now. And then actually what was said to me was, you know, we just don't want to do the same old Maslow stuff, so or situational leadership or action centered leadership, just something new and different that, that, that is very related to up to date research. So, yeah, long winded way of answering that question. No, it doesn't directly relate to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's based on psychological research, current psychological research. Uh, another question um, that we've had. So, and, and somebody, um, and if you're if you're still with us and you want to chip in, feel free. Um, but someone said in challenging situations um, and in amongst you know, all the trauma um, that people have been experiencing recently, what one positive thing is there that um, that she can focus on? Okay, I, I think Miss, this is an exercise we do in our full program, and you know this, Ellie. I think there are loads of things we can do. I encourage people to make a daily practice or regular practice of sitting down, get yourself a journal, think about and write down things you're grateful for. It's not rocket science. That's, you know, that's not our thing. You wouldn't make that up. People have been encouraged for years to be grateful. Uh, Ellie, I, I, on my third journal of gratitude, I've filled, well, I've filled two and on my third. And I do that regularly, nearly every day. It's odd days I don't. I'll write one thing, sometimes I'll write three things, sometimes I will fill a page, sometimes I just pick it up and read it. And I think some of the, that's not to be um, delusional and away with the fairies, that's, I think a most people, unwittingly, most people's perspective of their life is out of kilter with the reality of it. And what I mean by that is, if you don't mind me having 30 seconds on this, is this okay? No, no absolutely. If this is, if you imagine, if you will imagine, we have a spec, I call it a spectrum of life from, here to here. So we all have a life full of stuff at the moment, things, people, situations and circumstances. Now everybody, so I don't know any of you personally, but I would say everyone on this session 
down one end of your spectrum of life, you currently have a few things, a few things in your life that could be better than they currently are. Probably. Sometimes in life, we won't just have a few things that could be better than they currently are. We'll have one or two things that are tragic, traumatic, and you know, really unpleasant to deal with. You know, that's just called life, right? So we'll, but we always have at least a few things that could be better than they currently are. Now, coexisting with those few things that could be better than they currently are, probably for all of us, is an absolute shed load of stuff, which is pretty damn brilliant or amazing or good. What do most people spend most of their time thinking about and focusing on? All that stuff or those few things? And do they think about those few things in a constructive, helpful, what can I do about them sort of way? How can I overcome those problems? Or do they just ruminate on them and get into spirals about them? Many that will do that. So we actually end up thinking nearly all the time about these few things quite unhelpfully, never considering these things at all, usually. Mm -hmm. So we have a perspective of our lives, which is way out of kilter with reality. Now, if we've got a few things that could be better, my encouragement with people is look at them, think about them, set some goals, try and improve them, apply yourself. Sometimes you can't do anything about it, you just need to live with them. But whilst you're doing that, celebrate all this stuff. So as I said a little while ago, you know, this is not easy. I didn't like the fact that we had a load of work cancelled this month, but I can't do anything about it. So there's no point me spending the whole month miserable. What I can do is be grateful for my children are healthy. Sue's been with me for 34 years. That's amazing. I live in a lovely part of the world. I've got a dog that's amazingly loving. I've got you guys prepared to listen to me for 90 minutes. The sky was blue today. I could go on. And some people say I do, but the point is, I need to notice that stuff. And if I don't notice it, it's almost not there, but it is. So that's why I think gratitude is, isn't a pink fluffy thing. It is psychologically and emotionally one of the most amazing habits that we can engage in. And there is a lot of psychological research in the last 20 years that keeps reinforcing time and time and time again. Um, gratitude and appreciation are massive foundations for how happy we are. Kevin, can I chip in? Because I think that was that was interpreted as my question, but I, I didn't quite mean it in that way. What I meant it was, was that um, I, for me, if there's a challenging situation, I will always find something positive, um, no matter what, because I'm like you, count my blessings every single day. Um, I mean, just as an example, I, I actually fractured, um, badly fractured my leg um, when I was out running and I lay in the road thinking, well, at least I've not, not torn my cruciate ligament and at least I've not torn an artery and, I've, you know, killed yeah. over and died. So no matter what, yeah. there is always something. So and, what, and what you're saying sort of really resonates. Yeah, my, my sort of woman. That's brilliant. My sort of person. <laughs> well, well, so, I really it. enjoyed it. But it's not it's not pretending everything's lovely when it isn't because I, I just know it isn't it isn't as I say I use that phrase you know it's not great being away with the fairies be real but I don't think many people are real because all they they just they just indulge mentally in a few things that aren't great in life and if we're going to think about those things at all it should be constructively about what can I do about them and whilst I'm working at that stuff am I appreciative of, of the other things I have because we all have I mean certainly living in Britain most of us, most, for most of us, most of our life, most of the time, we have loads of great stuff. But we often don't feel like it because we're not referencing it. So Yeah, uh, completely yeah. agree. Yeah, totally. Thanks, thanks Anne. And uh, yeah, I hope your leg repairs. <laughs> it's fine. It's two years on now. But, okay, um... good, good, good. but Anne, sorry I, sorry I misinterpreted your question. But oh, no worries. On the, um, on the flip side of that, it was a, a, a great topic just to get some conversation on. on yes, it was. Lots yeah. of people have commented about how they, um, they use gratitude and they do gratitude journals. And, and I, I think from coming on your course, I don't know whether it was like 10 odd years ago, mm. Gab, yeah. you know, I, yeah. I still do my gratitude journal every day. And, it, and I think it really does make a difference. Um, I have something, Ellie, around gratitude, just... Some of you might be aware of this anyway. Um, when we're thinking about writing down stuff to be grateful for, so I think writing it down is brilliant and expressing it makes it more powerful. So if you thank people, if you tell them, if you tell others you're grateful for something, you write it down, that's expressing it. If you were thinking about something, just, just think about it, writing it down and then moving on quickly probably isn't the thing to do. It's actually, we, we challenge people. When you're engaging in gratitude, immerse yourself in it. So if I'm thinking about how grateful and appreciative I am that my son, has lived in Saudi Arabia for eight years. I, I miss him, but he's just built an amazing life for himself. He's going to be coming back over here, hopefully in the next year or two, to move back to England. But he's just, he's worked so hard. He's done such a great job of setting himself up in life. And I'm really grateful for that. I don't just reference it verbally, think, yeah, that's great. 
I immerse myself, I'll think about it. And, and to mentally simulate it is a really useful thing. So we talk, so let's visualize it. So just imagine, use the words, but sit in it. Just imagine, we call it sitting in your gratitude, immerse yourself in it. And the more specific your gratitude is, the better. So when you're being grateful for someone, if you just say, I'm really grateful for my dad, no, be grateful to, to, to your dad because of, does that make sense? Because of something specific, because actually the gratitude psychologically and emotionally has more meaning and it deepens it and strengthens it. So yeah, I just wanted to share those things just in case that can add to someone's gratitude practice for them. Brilliant. Has anybody else got any other questions that they want to um, jump in and, and ask Gav or put in the chat box and I'll ask? Because I know he's gone through quite a lot. Just got one more sheet to show you. Sheet to show you. It's not easy to okay. say. <laughs> just in case, if you're curious, your curiosity, um, we've got a fairly new Mindspan website. There's, it, sh it shares on there with you, particularly in a coaching and training sense, more of our products. Um, if you love your podcasts, um, a few months ago, that's one of the things we, we, we got, actually got on with and used our time wisely for. We have a fortnightly podcast called What's the Matter, which is me and my daughter. So it's a dad-daughter combo. Um, it's conversational. It's informal. We try to take a sort of psychological subject and simplify it and chat about it. Um, there's usually a bit of banter on it. She takes the mickey out of me a fair bit. But again, it's, um, they're usually half an hour to 45 minutes. Um, but yeah, it, might, it may be a cup of tea or it might not be, but we'll be talking about lots of things that we have some passions around. And something else that we've brought forward this year, we created a sister business, which is now licensing um, becoming a Mindspan coach or trainer. So if you know anybody who is thinking about, you know, changing their career or adding to what they do, or they want to do something part-time alongside something else around coaching or training, um, yeah, just point them in our direction because we, we are, I trained our second cohort of coaches last week. Um, and our next, we're running those trainings uh, quarterly for coaches, twice yearly for trainers. But it's an opportunity for someone to um, be licensed in our sort of methodology. <clears throat> they can develop their own business and clients, but they do it with our help and support. So, yeah, if you, if you know anybody, I'm not trying to recruit you guys necessarily. I'm just saying if you know anybody, just th throw them in our direction and we can at least talk to them about and tell them what the opportunity is. Um, I'm on a, a mission, have been for quite a long time, as Ellie knows. We were, our vision as a business is to positively impact 10 million people. And I concluded a long time ago, I can't really do that on my own. <laughs> so you're so, going to be really tired. <laughs> trying for years. But yeah, but, um, yeah so we're gathering a merry bunch of the right people to really go and influence other people's lives and businesses and organisations positively and constructively. So, yeah, um, it would be remiss of me not to mention that. Just in no, case. That's great. And what I'll do, Gav, is I'll share, obviously, all of your contact details um, with everybody when I send through the recording. Yeah. Um, AMS has... Ams asks, is there a visual representation of your models that she can share with her learners on an ILM management program? Uh, we have got slides and bits. If you give that and my contact details. Yeah. You can have a conversation I'll, offline. Yeah, and I can, I can, any of you, I can send you some stuff, but rather than just send a whole lot of stuff out to everybody, yeah. just take my details and make a request and we'll have a chat and I can send you something that's appropriate. Brilliant. That's um, I just Gavin. want to say thank you for turning up, everybody. No, thank you so much for um, for all your wisdom and your thoughts and for being so engaging. Um, I knew the session would be great. We've, we've obviously, you've covered a lot. So thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. And, um, yeah, getting lots of 10 out of 10s. And thank you, Gavin. And fabulous lot <laughs> Really insightful, really interesting. So um, thank you very much. And okay. hopefully I will see you very soon, one day. Yeah. <laughs> one day thank soon. You, Thanks for your time. Everybody else, thank you for joining us and I will see you all soon and let you know about our uh, following up our next live webinar, our next speaker. So, Cheers everyone. Thank you everybody. Bye. Bye, thank you.